In this video, I walk you through some of the important structures that we see in the inferior view of the skull. I start from the anterior structure, which would be heart palate. Heart palate is made of maxillary bones and palatine bones. In general, as you can see here, maxillary bones form the anterior three quarter of the heart palate and palatine bones form the posterior part of the heart palate. We named this part of the maxillary bones that form the front of heart palate, palatine processes of the maxillary bones. And we named the sections of palatine bones that form the posterior of the heart palate, horizontal plates of palatine bones. So we say that the heart palate is made of palatine processes of the maxillary bones and horizontal plates of the palatine bones. Between right and left, processes or plates, we do have a suture that is called median palatine suture. And between maxillary bones and palatine bones, we find another suture. This one is referred to as transverse palatine suture. So median palatine suture, transverse palatine suture. During the fetal life, the right and left processes and plates fuse together. If there is any failure in fusion of the processes or the plates together, we end up with a gap in the palate, which is called cleft palate. Even though we don't know exactly why, but it's been shown using the folic acid supplement during the time frame of the pregnancy, reduces the risk of the cleft palate. In the maxillary bones, I locate the alveolar processes that would be the part of the maxillary bone that has the alveolar sockets. Alveolar sockets are those deep openings that the root of our teeth sit inside. Behind the maxillary incisors, we find this opening, which is called incisive foramen. Some of the branches of maxillary nerve of trigeminal pass through the incisive foramen. When I move posteriorly and get to the horizontal plate of the palatine bones, then I can locate the greater palatine foramen and the lesser palatine foramina. Again, some of the branches of the maxillary nerve pass through them. So in the heart palate, we should locate incisive foramen, greater palatine foramina, and lesser palatine foramina. When we talk about the maxillary bones, it's good to note that maxillary bones also have some projections that articulate these bones to zygomatic bone. So if I show you this view, that would be the zygomatic process of the maxillary bone, which articulate with maxillary process of the zygomatic bone. And then here I have a view of the greater wing of the sphenoid bone, and I can see between maxillary bone and greater wing of sphenoid, we have a very large opening that is called inferior orbital fissure. So if I show you the inside of the orbit, we still should find the inferior orbital fissure. As you can see, this fissure is located between maxillary bone and greater wing of the sphenoid bone. Then I go back to basically follow and move toward the posterior. When I get to the posterior view of the nasal cavities, first I locate vomer, which is a facial bone. It forms part of the nasal septum. When I go toward the lateral wall of the nasal cavities, I see that the most posterior part of the lateral wall is made of sphenoid bone. These projections that we name them pterygoid processes of the sphenoid bone, we name the two that are closer to the midline, and these are the ones that form the most posterior lateral wall of the nasal cavities, medial pterygoid processes. Obviously, we name the other two lateral pterygoid processes. And as you see, medial pterygoid process of sphenoid articulate with vertical plate of the palatine bone. So the horizontal plate of palatine bone forms the posterior of heart palate and the vertical plate of palatine bone forms 
part of the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. And when we follow the lateral wall of the nasal cavity, deep inside we can see the inferior nasal conchi and also in this skull we can see the middle nasal conchi. I show you a better view of this nasal conchi to refresh our memory that inferior nasal conchi are facial bones but middle nasal conchi are part of ethmoid bone and in this view I can see vomer but please remember that in the anterior view the upper part of nasal septum is made of perpendicular plate of the ethmoid so going back again to the inferior view after locating these structures then I one more time focus on the greater wing of the sphenoid bone and on the greater wing I can locate foramen ovale recall for example mandibular branch of trigeminal nerve passes through foramen ovale and posterior and lateral to foramen ovale very close to the end of greater wing I can locate foramen spinosum as soon as we find foramen ovale and foramen spinosum medial to these two we should locate foramen lacerum recall foramen lacerum sits between sphenoid bone temporal bone and occipital bone and also recall that in a living human foramen lacerum is covered by a layer of fibrous cartilage however in a dried skull because we lose the fibrous cartilage foramen lacerum is open now I can walk through the temporal bone first thing that I notice is that temporal bone has this long process that is called zygomatic process of the temporal bone zygomatic process of the temporal bone articulate with this projection of zygomatic bone we name this temporal process of the zygomatic bone so each process gets the name of the other bone and when temporal process of the zygomatic articulate with zygomatic process of temporal together they form zygomatic arch this is the attachment point for some important muscles after finding zygomatic arch I move posteriorly and I locate this elevation that we name it either articular tubercle or articular eminence so if I move the skull like this I can see that this is the articular tubercle and behind articular tubercle I locate this depression that is called mandibular fossa inside the mandibular fossa we expect condyle of mandible articulate with so this is exactly the place that temporal bone articulate with mandible and form temporomandibular joints recall that the only joints in our skull that are movable we consider them diartroses movable joints are temporomandibular joints so in short mandibular fossa of temporal bone and mandibular condyles together form temporomandibular joints now from mandibular fossa I move toward midline and I locate the petrous portion of temporal bone on the petrous portion I locate this important canal that is called carotid canal we name it carotid canal simply because carotid artery passed through this posterior to carotid canal we locate jugular foramen recall jugular foramen is located between temporal bone and occipital bone and many important structures pass through the jugular foramen including jugular vein three of our cranial nerves cranial nerve number nine glossopharyngeal number 10 vagus number 11 accessory they all pass through the jugular foramina so what is important to note is that carotid canal we have to find it in petrous portion of temporal bone and right behind the carotid canal between temporal and occipital we look for jugular foramen now from jugular foramen I move lateral to find this pointy projection that is called styloid process if I change the view 
you can see that really cellulite process is a very pointy projection. That's the attachment site of some muscles. Lateral and posterior to styloid process, we see this bulky process that is called mastoid process. This is also attachment site of some muscles. Here in this view, I can easily locate external acoustic meatus. Clearly, this is the opening into the auditory canal. Between styloid process and mastoid process, I should locate stylomastoid foramen. Recall that's the place that facial nerves exit. So just to refresh our memory, if I go inside the cranial cavity, facial nerves enter the internal acoustic meatus, the one that is on the medial wall of the petrous portion. Facial nerves pass through this bone, temporal bone, and when they want to exit the skull, they exit through stylomastoid foramen. Behind mastoid process, we can locate the mastoid foramen. So the arrangement is styloid process, stylomastoid foramen, mastoid process, mastoid foramen. The last bone would be the occipital bone. First, I locate the foramen magnum. Lateral to foramen magnum, I can see these two round elevations we name them occipital condyles, or you can say condyles of the occipital bone. These two articulate with the first cervical vertebral bone, which is called either C1 or atlas. So basically the occipital condyles articulate with atlas and form a joint name, atlanto-occipital joints. In atlanto-occipital joints, we have up and down movement of the skull. For example, when you nod. Lateral to foramen magnum, but superior to foramen magnum, we locate the hypoglossal canals. Right now I'm pointing at the right hypoglossal canal. Recall that that's the pathway for hypoglossal nerves to exit the skull. Then I locate this projection in the middle of the occipital bone. You can actually palpate and find this in your own skull we call this external occipital protuberance. At the same level as external occipital protuberance, we can locate these lines, we call them superior knuckle lines, and then inferior to them, we can find these rough projections, we call these inferior knuckle lines. In short, superior and inferior knuckle lines are attachment sites of some muscles. The last bone that I will discuss would be mandible, here we have an inferior view of the bone mandible, but quickly I want to remind you when we talk about mandible, we need the lower part of the mandible, body of the mandible, and those projections that go up, we name them rami of the mandible. So that would be the right ramus, and this is the left ramus. And when you follow each one of these two rami, you end up with two projections. The posterior projection is the mandibular condyle. That's the one that actually articulate with the temporal bone to form the temporomandibular joint. And the anterior projection is called coronate process. Between condyle and coronate process, we have this depression, which is called mandibular notch. And when we look at each one of these condyles, that would be the head of condyle and then the narrow part is called the neck of the condyle. And as you see in the anterior, we can locate this depression that is called pterygoid fovea. When I follow the coronate process, that sharp angle is called oblique line. And in the anterior view, I locate the alveolar process. That's the place for the alveolar sockets that hold the root of our mandibular teeth. I quickly locate the mental foramina that are located on the body of the mandible on the external the nerves that are branches of the mandibular nerves of trigeminal pass through them. And then in the external view, I can locate the mental protuberance. Exactly where ramus meets body, we can locate the angle of the mandible. So now I'm ready, I go back to the inferior view. That would be the mandibular angle on both sides. And then when I look at the internal surface of the body, 
I locate this line that is called mylohyoid line. Above mylohyoid line, I have a depression that is called sublingual fossa. That's the place, for example, we're looking for sublingual salivary gland. And below the mylohyoid line, I can find another depression that is called submandibular fossa. Obviously, this is the place that submandibular salivary gland sits in. So in both sides, I locate the submandibular fossa versus sublingual fossa. And I can see, again, the internal view of the alveolar process. In the internal view of the ramus, I locate this important opening that is called mandibular foramen. A very important branch of the mandibular nerve of trigeminal passes through the mandibular foramen. So that's the other mandibular foramen. And then I can see a small elevation projection that is called lingula. And then in the internal view of the body, I locate these rough projections that we call them genial spines. So that's a very short summary of the structures that we see in mandible either in external view or internal view. I hope you find this information helpful.